Good morning. We're going to read about uh, a little bit about John the Baptist today, and actually, it's there's sort of two parts in in Luke. Luke writes about John the Baptist in the third in the third chapter of his gospel. Now, he's already written about the birth of Jesus in the second chapter, right? You go to the second chapter of Luke, and you read the very familiar uh, story of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Well, then in the third chapter, Luke moves on now to talk about his uh, ministry, which would begin uh, when he was 30. We don't know a lot about his life between his birth and the beginning of his ministry. Uh, we know that about he, uh, one little part there about when he was 12 years old and he was at the temple, and but that's about it. We don't know a lot about those years. But now we're going to look at uh, we're going to read a little bit about John the Baptist because John the Baptist, his job was to get the people ready, not for Jesus' birth, but for his ministry. Okay? So I'm going to read, uh, let me see here, about six verses. And then this text here continues next week. Uh, so next week it focuses more on his message what he had to say, and uh, we remember John the Baptist was a very powerful preacher, uh, but today I'm going to I'm going to focus more on him, on, his, on the person that he was. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria <coughs> and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of, Anani of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And uh, John then went, and, and he went into all the region about the Jordan. John went into all the region preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet. This is from Isaiah now, and these words apply to John. And this is what Isaiah wrote about, and he would have written this about 700 years before John. <clears throat> the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would impart your holy word through my words and the meditations of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today we're going to talk more about John the Baptist and not so much about his message. That maybe will be next week. Uh, first off, let's uh, remember who John the Baptist was in relation to Jesus. I'm sure you all know this, but let's review it. Like it says, John the Baptist was the son of Zechariah. Now, Luke doesn't mention the name of his mother. But, of course, his mother was Elizabeth. Remember? Uh -huh. I'll refresh your memory. It's always great if we can kind of, you know, see how this fits. 
Remember in, uh, in, 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 I don't know how many of the Gospels it's in, it might be two or three, but it, maybe it's just Luke, I can't remember. But uh, remember when it says about Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she's expecting, she is with child. And Mary goes to visit her kinswoman, which probably means her cousin. Mary, who has, she's going to have Jesus now, she's expecting. And Mary decides to go and visit Elizabeth, who is also expecting. And uh, Mary and Elizabeth are cousins. They're kinswomen, so let's just say they're cousins. Because they probably were. Maybe they were second cousins, third cousins, I don't know. But they were related. So Mary goes to see her cousin. And that's always interesting. I love it if you read about it. Because it says that when Mary, I always think of it like, a, you know, there's this house. And here's the pathway up to the house. And Elizabeth is maybe on the porch. Or maybe she stepped down or something. But she's here at the house, and she's looking, and uh, she sees Mary coming up the lane toward her. Ah. Anybody remember some of what she said? Did she say, Hail Mary? Okay. Hail Mary? Did she say, Hello Mary? Blessed are you among women. Isn't that where that is? I think. I think that's where the Ave Maria comes from. I should have checked it out a little more, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Hail Mary, full of grace. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That's where our Catholic friends get the Hail Mary. Any Catholics here? Oh, yeah. Yes. Did I, I say it about correctly? My wife was Catholic. In the eyes of the Catholic Church, she still is. She's just sort of a departed, gone astray. <laughs> when we got married, she was Catholic. And I was Lutheran. And uh, so we couldn't be married in the Catholic Church. So we got married in my church. But she was still Catholic. We just didn't mention it to anybody. <laughs> there were some of my relatives that wouldn't have come if they'd known that. And some of hers. This was 52 years ago when there was still a lot of quarreling and stuff between Lutherans and Catholics. Thankfully, a lot of that is kind of gone by the wayside. But anyway, we got married, and I'm just saying this because she became, I never said, now you got to become a Lutheran. I never, I didn't believe in that. Uh, but she did become a Lutheran on her own. Shortly after we got married, I got a draft notice. Shortly after that, I was in the Army, and shortly after that, I was in Vietnam. And when I was in Vietnam, she on her own went to the local Lutheran church. She was living with her parents, and there was a Lutheran church, and she went there, and she said, I want to become a Lutheran. So she took instruction and became a Lutheran. I didn't know a thing about it until I got home. She said, I'm a Lutheran. I said, are you Norwegian? <laughs> no, no, she's French. It took her 15 years to learn to like Lutefisk. Why? Well, anyway. So Mary comes to see Elizabeth, and Elizabeth sees her and greets her. And then, now this is so important. And uh, maybe we talk more about this next time, but. It says that the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped. You know where I stand. I'm pro-life. I really love the Catholic Church. 
on that issue, they're pro, I don't want a lot of ways, but I mean, they're pro-life. My own denomination, some of it is pro-life, but some of it is just, of course, they're all way off there anyway. But. I'm pro-life because I believe that human life begins at conception. And I believe that human life is never to be taken except in certain very narrow circumstances. And uh, why do I believe that? Well, it wasn't a fetus that leaped in the womb. Come on. It wasn't an embryo. It wasn't a collection of cells or some dumb thing. It was, the Bible says it was a baby, and the baby leaped in Elizabeth's womb. And Mary was carrying a baby who just happened to be the savior of the world. All right. Now, so that's all we know, that we know about John the Baptist. Well, there's a little more, but we know about John the Baptist. So I think the first time John the Baptist and Jesus meet, they're both in their mother's womb. But I believe, I believe that, the, you know, the Holy Spirit, he's not limited like we are. You know, I, here's what you've got to believe, and I know you do. You've got to believe what the Bible says, right? I mean, if we don't believe what the Bible says, we might as well just give up and just go off into the sewer. Because that's where a lot of people are. Am I right? There's a lot of that. You look at our culture, you look at our society today, and if you don't think it's in the sewer, you're not looking very hard. We say that life is, I don't know, life is whatever we say it is. Marriage is whatever we say it is. Gender is whatever we say it is. It's all crazy. It's nonsense. We believe what the Bible says. Just as people have been believing that, we might interpret it a little differently. That's okay. You know, we, we might well, you know, like uh, when, when, uh, when uh, Jesus said to Peter, upon you I'm going to build my church, our Catholic brothers and sisters believe that Peter was the first pope. I can understand that. We believe, well... He wasn't talking about Peter, his person, but his faith. Okay, maybe we can talk about that. But on some of these other issues, there can be no debate. I don't want to hear any debate about what marriage is. Marriage is between one man and one woman, and it's to be held in honor by all. And it's not between two men or a man and a dog. It's one man one woman, that's what it is. Now, oh yeah, that's right, you're filming this, aren't you? <laughs> I could get some, woo! But you see, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not, I, my calling is to preach. <clears throat> The gospel, it's to preach the truth. That's what it is. And uh, that's your calling, by the way. Your calling is to follow Jesus and to listen to what he says, not to what some lunatics say on the radio or the TV or wherever. Don't listen to any of that nonsense. You listen to what the Bible says. All right, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but John the Baptist was born around the same time as Jesus. They were cousins. Let's just say third cousins. Something like that. Now, we don't know a lot about John the Baptist's childhood or his youth any more than we do about Jesus, but here's what we know. John the, because that's what it says, John the Baptist was called to prepare the way of the Lord. 
How did it happen? Well, you know, we, we're not told a lot of detail, but we're told enough. <clears throat> and John the Baptist was a kind of a strange fellow. He lived out in the wilderness, and he wore a, and I think it's Mark, it says that he wore a leather girdle, <laughs> and he ate locusts and honey. <clears throat> I can see the honey. I'm not sure about locusts. <laughs> but he was different. He was a different sort of man. But he had a very unique calling. Very unique calling. God called him to fulfill the prophecy of, of uh, Isaiah that had written about 700 years before. He was to be the one out in the wilderness. And that's where he preached. And I like this part. It doesn't say that he went to where the people were. It says that the people went to where he was. Isn't that interesting? Huh? They went out into the wilderness to hear this guy. So his message had to have been very compelling. It's what the people wanted to hear. Have you heard this guy, John the Baptist? Where is he? Oh, he's out in the wilderness. Well, let's go out and hear him. Man, what he's talking about, we better listen. See, I think, oh, I wish, I wish there were a, a more John the Baptists around today. That's what we need. And, of course, we don't even have Billy anymore. We don't even have Billy Graham. He's gone home to be with the Lord. His preaching days are over. We need. We need to get back to the truth. Or I'm telling you, we're going to go down. And that's going to be just an awful shame. It's going to be just terrible. Because I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. If the bright and shining light of liberty goes out in America, the world is going to be dark for a long time. You mark my word. I, we won't see it. But our grandchildren might. Our grandchildren might. This is a great country. God made this country. He blessed this country. But if we go astray like we're going now, we're going to go down just like Israel went down. Just like the southern, first the northern kingdom collapsed in 922, the southern kingdom was overrun by Babylonians in 587. So, but they went out to hear John the Baptist. And uh, next week, you read a little further, it's about some of his sermons. One of the things he said, if you want to know what kind of preacher John the Baptist was, he wasn't any namby-pamby. That's what you hear a lot today. You know, the preacher's job is to stand up there and just sort of mumble along and make sure that you feel good. I'm okay, you're okay, and, or blabber on about something you can't do anything about. Oh, by the way, back there, starting, starting uh, this week and for the next three weeks, that box back there, and I put it in the update, we're going to be collecting new underwear for homeless men and women and for poor men and women. Now, you're not going to find that in some of your sophisticated <laughs> churches. They're probably going to say, write out a check, and we'll decide how to spend it. No, we do. I mean, you, you put your gifts in the offering, yes, but you know how we spend it. And if you don't pick up one of those papers that tells you how we spend your money, Almost 70% of your money here is spent to help the poor, to help the homeless, and to help those in need. Well, that's what that box is about. I want you, and the reason we did it is one of the members said, you know, poor people can go to the Salvation Army, they can go to Genesis, they can go to Hope Women, and people you can leave off. I've had many times if a... You know, the mom dies, and, or the wife dies, and the man, the husband says, Pastor, what am I going to do with all her clothes? And we take care of that. There's a place for her clothes. 
Or if the husband dies, there's a place for his clothes, his overcoat, his, but not underwear. They don't, a lot of them don't take that. I mean, you know, used. They want it new. So here's what I want you to do, and I know you're going to do it, because you've done it a thousand times. This week, go to Walmart or one of the stores, Kmart, Target, and buy some underwear. Buy some new underwear. Leave it in the in the wrapping. Don't unwrap it. Because they want to see. And socks. Thank you. They want to see that it's new. And for men and women. So ladies, you know, you could go and buy what the ladies need. And buy what the men need. And bring it and put it there. And I just know that in three weeks, we're just going to have underwear and socks just flowing all over the place. <laughs> and then we're going to take those items to several different places and poor people and homeless people. You know, I've said this before, but I see all these homeless guys, and some of them are Vietnam veterans, just like me. But they're homeless, they're poor. Some of them, they've had their head, they've got mental problems. They're human beings. At one point in time, they were young soldiers who raised their hand and they said, I'm going to serve my country. They were young once, like we were young once, and their lives haven't gone very well. And there's a lot of people like that. But you know and we know they're human beings created in the image of God. And we don't get up on any pedestal and look down our noses at anybody because God has saved us. He sent his only begotten son so that we may no longer be lost but saved. And our job is to try to do what we can to rescue others. So, I just know I, if, I never go to Walmart. I, my wife will do the shopping. She does all the shopping. But I know if I were to go to Walmart, I'd see some of you, and you'd be over in the men's clothing department, and then some would be over in the ladies' clothing department. I know it's going to happen. Okay. Tangent. <laughs> but anyway, so John the Baptist, his calling then was to prepare the way of the Lord. And he was preaching right before Jesus' ministry was to begin. And a little bit further, it tells about how when Jesus came there to where John was, and John knew who it was. And remember then, uh, Jesus goes down into the Jordan and, and is baptized. At first, John said, well, I can't baptize you. But Jesus said, no. He said, you you baptize me. You know, part of, I mean, it's the calling of the preacher. And I've been doing this for, in June, it'll be 45 years. Haven't always done such a good job. But as I look back, I don't think I've done an awful job. I don't think I've ever, uh, I don't think I've ever preached falsehood. I don't think I've ever just stood up and said something that's just absolutely false, just not true. Which happens today. Again, it's happening. But what we need, but it can't be just the preachers, what, what the church needs today more than anything else it needs for the gospel to be proclaimed in all of its glory and majesty. But it needs to be proclaimed in word and deed. And if we could get back to that, we just might experience a revival. We might experience a reawakening. I believe, 
as St. Augustine believed, that every heart is restless until it rests in God. And I believe a lot of what this foolishness is going on, and it's just crazy. You see, now we're... I can't, it's hard to even talk about. It's so crazy. It's just insane, some of it. I believe that we could have a turning away. That's what repentance is. John preached a message of repentance. To repent means to turn away. And what we need to do as a culture, what we need to do as people, whatever you, you need to turn away from all the nonsense and turn toward the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I am a way. I am a truth. I am all life, but you know, whatever. <laughs> oh, I get so angry. I don't get angry at young people when they say, whatever. And another one now is life. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? You know, like. Our children aren't even being, aren't even being taught how to speak. I hear some of the teachers, they're no better than the children. I used to have my confirmants used to say that, like, and I'd stop it right now. I said, what do you mean, like? I mean, you know, like, I think I'm going to, I don't, I, I, I'll, I'll, I like, I'll have chocolate. Well, no, like, I'll have vanilla, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> Come on. That's not, but that's, and the other one is whatever. Oh, whatever. You heard that? Whatever. Whatever. Oh, man. It's not whatever. Jesus is not whatever. It's, you know, the, there aren't five ways. Whatever, you know, whatever. Choose your own, whatever. No. He's the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. And what he says is the truth because he is the truth. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Human life begins at conception. Gender is not a preference. It is a given. When our two sons were born, as long as he's televising, go ahead, I'll get it. <laughs> I might as well get all kinds of emails telling me what an idiot I am. <clears throat> when our two sons were born, the doctor didn't say, whatever. <laughs> I wasn't in the room. This is really, should I tell you? <laughs> well, I was only, I was just young. I came back, I was still in the army, came home for the birth of our son. And uh, so the doc, Jeannie, my wife said, well, you can be in the room if you want. It was just starting. This 48 years ago. And uh, so the men, the daddies could be in the birth, in the room, you know. Where, and I didn't know. I, said, I don't want to be in there. And so I said to my wife, now this is awful. I said to my wife, I have helped calves being born on many occasions. It can't be that different. <laughs> and we're still married after 52 <laughs> uh, but it isn't but that's what we've come to now some even say you don't put the gender on the birth certificate because that can be decided later no it can't that's enough that's crazy. That's crazy. Well, John the Baptist, a great preacher with a tremendous calling. There again, the Lord knew what he was doing. He had to have a man totally committed to the mission to which he'd been called. 
And of course, we know what happened to John. It's what's happened to a lot of Christians down through the centuries. John's ministry cost him his life. Cost him his life. One of my great heroes that I've talked about before, I've read the biography by Metaxas. If you haven't read it, read it. It's big. It's about that big, thick a book on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Get it. Read it. The great Lutheran. Oh, I wish all our Lutheran preachers today were like he was. Instead of kowtowing to all this nonsense, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the face of Hitler said, I will not bow down. I will not say Sig Heil. I will not bend the knee to the Fuhrer. And it cost him his life. Yeah. There were hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of Christians in Europe, like Corrie Ten Boom and her family. And what did they do? They gave shelter to the Jews. They hid the Jews that the Gestapo were hunting for. And if they were found out, they died. They died. See, for me, I used to tell my contramans this. I say to be a follower of Jesus ain't for sissies. It's not namby-pamby. To be a follower of Jesus is to stand up for the truth because he is the truth. Stand up for the truth. And if that means you are ridiculed, if that means you're made fun of, if that means you're called every phobic, you know, that's the new one, oh, you're a bigot, you're a fan, all. If that's what it leads to, so be it. And if it leads to your death, so be it. I know that when I die, it's going to be the beginning of eternal life for me. Not because I deserve it, oh, not in a billion years, but because I know Jesus died for me. I know that in my heart. He died for me and he rose again. And so when I die, even as my body goes back to the ground, my soul will be taken up into heaven and I'm going to live forever. And I'm going to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. You're going to hear those words too. But not if you abandon. Not, there's a lot of people aren't going to hear those words. They think they are, but they're not. If we turn our... John said, repent. Turn toward your salvation. Turn toward Jesus. Not everybody did. Jesus, if you want to walk away from him, if you want to turn away from him, you can do it. But you're not going to hear the words, well done, enter into the kingdom. You're going to hear the words, depart from me into the outer dark. prayers now we have lifted up before your throne of grace in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.